Hi, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you to the September 2023 meeting of the Delaware Astronomical Society. I'm going to share the screen really quickly so you can see some of our upcoming events, some exciting things coming up. Uh, also, really quickly, do we have any new members like to introduce yourselves? Okay. By all means, I'll turn this around for you. Oh, hi. Uh, I'm Sean, you can help me, James, as well. Uh, so I visit here uh, mid August, uh, Tuesday night. I think Jeff, right? I mean, introduced me to this membership and I enjoy it immediately. Uh, I just here here April. Uh, so it's been a while. I pretty enjoyed this area. And before that, I have some uh, experiences with uh, within Dallas. So I was with North Texas, I think, yes, and North Texas Astronomical Society for a while. Most time we just over the Zoom. That's uh, coincided with the pandemic mm -hmm. era. And before that, my only uh, astronomy uh, experience was when I was in Atlanta, I visited the uh, Georgia Tech uh, mm -hmm. Observatory. I think that's a fascinating one. Uh, very impressive. See some like this, maybe Sart and Moon for sure. So I get fascinated. So I, 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 I that's starting of my journey uh, for astronomy. Um, uh, I'm very glad, very pleased to find a, uh, I would say uh, association here, uh, find a circle. Uh, so I'm looking forward to more uh, interaction, uh, meetings, uh, outreach activities, or any type of volunteer activities. Um, yeah, thank you, everybody. Thank Welcome. you. Welcome to the club. Anybody else? Any other new members? New to our meetings, right? Oh, okay. Yeah, you've been here before. Okay. <laughs> I know he's been active with the APC. Sure. All right, ladies and gentlemen. So we have a few things that we want to announce that are coming up. Uh, first of all, I'd like to point out that the Vernon lecture is actually this Thursday. So you definitely want to check that out. Mount Cubus put that together. Be sure to pre-register for that so that you can come. We're going to have a great speaker. And it is the University of Delaware. I believe it's in Clayton Hall, correct? Okay, it should be very exciting. You should check it out. Uh, we also have the Woodside Farm Creamery. Jeff, you want to talk about that? Yeah, so Ben, we've had a pretty unfortunate run with Woodside this year. I think we've had four events. One of them went pretty smooth. Another one about five minutes after we showed up, there was a lightning and thunderstorm and all the rest. We didn't even make it that far. I canceled them before they happened. Um, uh, if the weather has been nothing but consistent. This Friday does not look too great, but... Um, my general approach with Woodside is unless it's going to be raining, I will err on the side of calling it because, as I say, if nothing else, if it's cloudy, that just gives more time to eat ice cream. <laughs> um, and obviously, it's up to any individual members if they you know, want to come or not. Um, again, at this point, the weather does not look good. But the other thing I've learned this summer is the weather forecasts have been almost wrong. So the fact that they're calling for it to be cloudy might mean that it will be clear. But anyhow, True. keep your eye. I'll be announcing that over the groups.io with a final call probably Thursday. Um, again. 90% Yeah. Uh, figured. All right. Which does suck because those events are a lot of fun. Um, and we do get a pretty good turnout from the club for volunteers to help with that event. And this year has just been abnormally terrible for that. Yeah. All right, very good, thank you. Uh, Bill, do you have any announcements for the APC? Um, yeah, so we moved the date in October from the 14th to the 21st. Okay. And the announcement will go out over the groups.io uh, GAS group. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. we'll let you know closer to the meeting what the uh, agenda will be. Very good. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any book club announcements, Mary? Yes, I do. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I hope you'll join us on Thursday, September the 28th uh, at 7 p.m. via Zoom. The book club will be discussing Adventures of an Eclipse Chaser by Roderick J. Hill. Uh, Roderick Hill will be joining us along with his wife, Monica. Uh, Jim Kirshen uh, will be leading the meeting. Uh, the book is available via in Kindle format and in paperback via Amazon at a very good price. It's not too late to read it. It's a wonderful compendium about um, eclipses. Uh, it has a fantastic appendices 
And Rod discusses not only traveling to and fro these wonderful exotic climbs to chase eclipses, but he also discusses astrophotography, the actual photography process um, and the filters and the settings on cameras to achieve the best photographs. And it's, it's just a darn good read. Um, and our October meeting, I'd like to just mention, uh, we will be commemorating the tercentenary of the death of Antony von Leeuwenhoek um, and the landmark 2023 exhibition of Jan von Meer's work at the Reich Museum. Uh, Laura Snyder, the author of Eye of the Beholder, uh, will be joining us for our discussion and Robert Stack will be leading the meeting. Mm -hmm. And finally, we just found out today that in February, uh, we will be joined by the leading scholar in the work of William and Margaret Huggins, who will help us to celebrate the bicentenary of the birth of the English astronomer. Uh, he's known for his pioneering work in astronomical spectroscopy together uh, with his wife, Margaret. So we're really delighted to have been able to add Dr. Barbara J. Becker to our calendar. She's a retired emeritus professor, science historian. That's it. I hope you can join us for all the meetings, uh, the book club meetings. Uh, your guests are welcome. And even if you don't read the book, you're certainly welcome to come. You're also welcome to submit questions in advance that can be submitted to the group and the author. Thank you. Good evening. Very good. Thanks. Do we have any other announcements? If not, then it's quickly. Oh, sure. uh, tomorrow night, Scott Jackson and I are going up to the Blue Mountain Vista for a dark sky session. If anyone's willing to join us, you're perfectly welcome. Yeah, I'd cool. love to go that for the next day. Yeah. Any other announcements? Uh, Jim, did you have an announcement? I'm sorry. Sure. Yeah. Uh, the, um, the DAS is going to put together a um, an introductory to astronomy course um, for <clears throat> any uh, any interested parties. Uh, looks like it's going to be about four sessions. Um, basically, going to start with um, uh, like viewing uh, the uh, the, the planets and uh, the solar system and, and things like that. And then basically, uh, once that knowledge has been accumulated, basically going out and observing the planets uh, with, the, with the telescopes out here. So it's going to be some classroom work first and then uh, ob observational work uh, later. Uh, there's going to be an uh, astrophotography component uh, to it also. So um, I'm going to be soliciting uh, volunteers from the DAS membership to, to teach the course. Um, that's, that's one announcement. Uh, second announcement is um, there is an outreach event at, um, at the New Newark uh, Reservoir on uh, October the 24th. A bunch of Girl Scouts uh, are going to be, um, are going to be, uh, Condensing there at the uh, at the at the reservoir, and um, the uh, the scoutmaster is going to be uh, there. Not and what I have? Uh, Did you arrange that one, Jim? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah we should put it on the calendar. Because... What's that? You can put it on the calendar. At some point, if you want. Okay. But is uh, that a DAS event? Or... Yeah. Okay. Yes, it's a D. And I and I'm just soliciting volunteers. Okay. Uh, to bring out their scopes and then whatever. Very good. You should have sent us Say the date please. October 24th. It's a Tuesday. Are you yeah. going to have the access road open? Uh, yeah. I have called the, um, I've called the, um, uh, the reservoir, uh, and I don't need permits, of course, but um, uh, they did not mention anything about well, an access road. Jim, here's, I've run several events at the reservoir in the past. Why don't we talk at the end of the, during the refreshments time? Okay. And I can give you my, what I know. Okay. Okay, cool. Anything else? All right. If not, I think we're ready to start. Jeff, I'll stop the share and click to begin. Cool. So um, before we get into today's meeting, I want to give a little sneak peek to next month because it's actually uh, relevant to some 
upcoming activities. Uh, so next month, our October meeting, our speaker is going to be our NASA ambassador, John Conrad. And he's going to be talking about NASA's Osiris Rex mission, named after my favorite dinosaur. Um, the Osiris Rex mission flew out and orbited an asteroid. Please, anyone correct me if I screw up the details. And then landed or swept by the asteroid and scooped up some chunks and is going to be bringing those chunks to the Earth. I believe that's the first time anything like this has happened. So during our April, October meeting, John Conrad is going to be sharing with us that mission. That's uncannily timely because it is supposed to happen this weekend that the spacecraft is going to deposit or dump the capsule into Earth's atmosphere and it's gonna land in the Arizona desert or something and then actually continue and fly on to, I believe another asteroid or something like that. So let's all keep our fingers crossed because you know conditions have to be right and trajectories have to be right for them to safely drop this capsule because they don't want to you know, send it through downtown Manhattan. I suggested DC would be a good landing spot, but um, but uh, if all the conditions are right, they will be dropping the capsule this weekend. So let's all keep our fingers crossed because that would be awesomely timely for our talk uh, a few months later. So stay tuned for that talk. That's a pretty awesome mission. Um, I feel like a lot of NASA and space stuff is sort of abstract because it's, but this is like, bringing some stuff closer to home. So that'll be really interesting. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, but that's next month. Uh, this month, um, as Hopefully the board started this call, but... is our What I Did This Summer. So we have, I think, seven members who are giving mini talks this month. So that is awesome. A uh, really nice round uh, bunch of activities over the summer. Uh, because we have so many, I just want to really urge that if our speakers could try to keep it to 10 minutes, um, maybe I'll start giving you the evil eye around 10 minutes and maybe try to kind of wrap it up within the next two minutes or so. And maybe at the 15 minute mark, we'll come with the with a cane. And But anyhow, okay. um, it'll probably all average out and be just fine. So first up, uh, not exactly what I did this summer, but more an upcoming activity. Greg Lee is going to be talking about the upcoming eclipse, but maybe not the one that everyone's thinking about. Not the one that's getting all the news. Yeah. You want to the, uh, can you get me to the internet? Yes, sir. At least maybe, I should say. Okay. Um, are the Zoomers seeing you this website? Sure. You didn't already do that? I understand. Yeah. You want to make bigger. Got uh, it. Yes. Another one. Oh, you can get the desktop. Yeah. Are the Zoom people now seeing this time and date website with a little clock right here, 818? Yes. Looks good. Thank you. Greg, all yours. I came across this website uh, kind of by accident because I was looking at uh, things that had to do with time zones. And uh, Bill had used it already too, but I discovered there's a lot of good astronomy information in this thing. So it, it makes it great. They have some good illustrations and actually um, little video m movies. Uh, so everybody knows about the big solar eclipses coming up uh, for totality in 24. Well, we get eclipses every six months somewhere. Uh, and it happens that we've got another, if you live in San Antonio, Texas, you're gonna get the big one, the total one, and you're gonna get this one coming up in October, which is not quite total. It's an annular eclipse, referring to this moon not being, being a little too far away from the Earth at the time of the eclipse, so it's not large enough to totally cover the sun. Not a super moon. And yeah, <laughs> it, it's, a, it's a mini moon. Yeah. And so and if you're on the center line, uh, you won't get totality, but you will get this ring of fire. And uh, if you live in San Antonio, you'll get the big one that's total, and you'll get the ring of fire here this coming up in October. 
but we can see a partial eclipse here in Delaware. And that's what this website shows you really good. Uh, if you go to timeanddate.com, and here it is. Uh, we scroll down here on the left side, and there's a. Uh, Can you make it to the speaker's photo? Sun and moon. Yeah, but it, and it showed Glenn for some reason. Lunar yeah. and solar eclipses. <clears throat> here's here's what coming what's coming up, and the next one that's up. Okay. Yeah, sorry, Greg. We just sorry want to clean something up real quick. Is October fourteenth. Sorry, I'm going to pin this. And now we're going to share the screen. I apologize, but it'll be better. And then we can do that. Awesome. And then Thank guaranteed you. to be pinned. Sorry for the interruption, Greg. No problem, man. <laughs> so people can see a little bit. Yeah, better. we're not hiding the screen. Now. That's great. So next up on the list of eclipses that we get every six months, it, somewhere in the world, uh, is October 14th. This is the correspondent uh, side of uh, what's coming up next December. I mean, next uh, in, in April of 24. Uh, you'll notice this eclipse here is coming like the 17 eclipse did from the northwest to the southeast. Uh, the one that we're seeing in uh, the total eclipse will come just the opposite because six months away, you've got the slope going from this side to this side. It happens every every six months. So uh, we click on this and it gives you <laughs> if you travel to put yourself on the center line like you would be getting totality, you will get annularity instead. So they, they have a nice little illustration of how this will look in in moving time, here comes the moon up at this. Let me see if this will enlarge without screwing things up. Hmm. Huh. That's uh, yeah, that's an interesting fact. I did retrograde. That that's because things are moving across the sky, and this is not. Mm -hmm. I assume the pause was. Just dramatic effect. The pause was the central moment of annularity, which is, I didn't get the amount of time on that, but it's a, a minute or two. Run, run through it again and it will pause. So this is not in real time, the no. simulation. The real time is about two, this is about three hours. What we see here in Delaware will be about two and a half hours. So it pauses. Now, see, there's right at the edge here, is thin and thick over here. So you get a few minutes of thick on one side, thin on the other side, and then that moment of central ring of fire equality all the way across. So that's what you'll see along that path of not totality, but annularity, um, which goes through San Antonio. But what do we see here in Delaware? We will still see not annularity, but we'll see a partial eclipse. So how am I going to put right there? Yep. Side. Um, let me. You can go on here and put in wherever you live. Wilmington, Delaware. And here's what we will see in Delaware. Uh, oh, so it's a real partial. It, it's only 26% covered from our view here. But you can see in this chart how far off the center line we, we are. And we're barely in the path of any partiality, right? Well, the partiality will go all the way up here to oh, this shaded area where if you live in Maine, 
you'll see the tiniest little nibble of the cookie edge. Yeah. You know, and down here in Delaware. New Brunswick's too bad. Anywhere, the, the closer you are down here mm -hmm. to the center line, the bigger bite it takes. So, yeah, up here in Delaware, we'll still see a bite, but it'll only be about 26%. Um, and this and will be a protective glasses at all times at event. all times yeah. even the annular eclipse will be yeah. all protective glasses yep. no time mm -hmm. can you ever take them off because even the smallest little diamond ring effect is too much uh, yeah. so yeah use your total glasses do not use sunglasses you even if you stack up six or eight sunglasses it's not enough i it just bought take 50 out the pairs of them they're still pretty cheap i'd say buy them now because you'll get double duty save them for april because i bet you get the real filter i bet glasses. you around march they're going to start going for about 10 bucks a pair and you can get them now for about 20 cents so yeah. And then you can them. Yeah. <laughs> so buy them now, use them for this eclipse, and then keep them for April. So put this on on your schedule. Um, it it takes about two and a half hours from the first contact. We'll start at midday, twelve o'clock. Twelve noon, right, Greg? Just after noon. Yep. Yeah. And then the most, the biggest bite we'll see from here will be about twenty six percent at one twenty, and then the last. Little past last contact at 247, so about two and a half hours in that spread. We're going to run a little public event here at Mount Cuba for people to come up and just have a look at a and, partial. And it will, without wearing the glasses, it will not be noticeable, like it won't be nope. noticeably darker. It won't be your eyes dip in the darkness, yeah, because even, even when you get in totality, you get down to there to 80 85 percent coverage. You still don't really lot of light. notice much. Yeah. 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 Uh, let me back up a minute because I wanted to mention here about eclipses in general. <laughs> here's what here's what's coming up. Look at this little calendar here. I, I said that we have eclipses somewhere in the world every six months. Uh, and along with the the solar eclipses you also have a lunar eclipse either two weeks before or two weeks after the solar, the solar eclipse and that's what you can see right here on the schedule here is back last april you remember in the news this was in indonesia total eclipse back in the in the spring they go spring to fall uh, and then we had the Lunar eclipse alignments weren't perfect. It just nipped the penumbra, but it was an eclipse two weeks after. Uh, then we come up here to the next one up is the, could have been a total if the moon was closer. Uh, it turns out to be an annular. But then two weeks after comes the paired up lunar eclipse because these things happen when the, when the moon is either full or the moon is new and it's two weeks in between. And you can see the same thing pattern going all the way through. But I just wanted to mention that as general eclipse information. So um, that's it. That's Thank you, Greg. Thank you. <laughs>
towards the end of July or the middle of August, depending on where it closest to the new moon. Um, so this year was the 100th anniversary of, of, uh, of the club forming, not the convention itself, but the actual club form. So where is the, where is uh, Springfield? It's held in Springfield, Vermont. Springfield, Vermont is right here on the southern edge of Vermont and New Hampshire in a little town of Springfield. And Springfield, besides having cellophane, is famous for the fact that in 2007, when The Simpsons had the movie that came out, they premiered, the, the, the premiere of the movie was in uh, Springfield, uh, Vermont. It was voted the home of The Simpsons. Actually, the home of The Simpsons is actually in Oregon, but they had the movie there. And that's Fat Grogan. He's the creator of The Simpsons. And they had these all these characters there. And if you go to this little town, they still have some of these uh, uh, fiberglass uh, statues out uh, for display. So um, in Springfield is about the size of downtown Newark. It's a little tiny New England town. It's got a cross, you know, Main Street and one street in the middle, and that's it. So mm -hmm. it's, but it's the, if you watch the Bob Newhart show, I stay uh, a little town, a little bit uh, uh, west of Springfield in a, in a uh, in, in there. And it's very much like the Bob Newhart show, except they don't have Daryl and Daryl there. Ah. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's very quaint. And, I, and I, I, like I said, I enjoy going to it every year. Uh, it's had a big effect on my life in that, um, like I said, I started going when I was 17 and I built a telescope um, because uh, uh, the former, when I was in high school, the uh, focus editor was a kid by the name of Jim Hassard, who I went to school with, and he had gone to Stelfane. He, he built a telescope and he won a prize, so I wanted to go up there and I convinced my parents to go. And uh, I won a first prize mechanical ingenuity when I was 17. And my father told me, look, Dave, looks like what you got, what it takes to be an engineer. Yeah. And I went, to, uh, I went to school for nine years and I got degrees in engineering and chemistry. And I gave a talk a number of years ago to a club out in Pennsylvania called uh, um, The Adventures in Telescope Making. And I tell people uh, the reason why I went to school and got those degrees was not because I wanted to be a chemist or an engineer, it was because I wanted to build better telescopes. <laughs> and I learned I learned a ton of skills from building telescopes. I mean, from of course optics, but physics and engineering and computer science and electronics and woodworking and you know metalworking and everything. So I've been, been building telescopes ever since then. So Stellafane itself is is this is the old part of Stellafane. This is where it originally starts. A little, it's about the size of Mount Cuba uh, around here, maybe a little bit more than that. That's where the original clubhouse is and the Porter Turret Telescope and a couple other things. And I'm gonna show mostly about what, what happens up here because that's where the telescope competition is um, and where the original part of Stellafane is. But Stellafane is actually quite large. It's got a couple hundred acres that have been donated. And down in this area is the new part of Stellafane called Stellafane East. There's a McGregor Observatory, which houses a 13 inch Shupman, which was telescope, which was the largest Shupman in the world for a while. Um, there's, uh, there's the bunkhouse, there's the amphitheater here, which is a natural hollow that in, if the weather's good, that's where they have the Saturday night talks and everything like that presentation. And down here, there's a, there's a, they have a pole barn, a huge pole barn that they have the, the Saturday afternoon talks in. And if it's the weather's no good for the sa uh, Saturday afternoon or uh, Sunday, the Saturday afternoon, Saturday, Saturday evening uh, facilities and, and talks, they'll have it in the pole barn here. So again, this is, it's huge, it's wooded. They get at least a, they get anywhere between 800 to a couple thousand to 1500 people. They had about over a thousand people this year show up. Um, it's it's got a sort of subdued carnival type atmosphere because, uh, like I said, they got food available. They sell T-shirts. They got a raffle. Uh, you know, they have a keynote speaker on Fridays. They have what's known as the informal talks. All kinds of subjects on astronomy, telescope making, optics. On Saturday, they have a number of formal talks. And Saturday evening, they have a main speaker. Uh, they've had people like uh, Alan Bean, which was the fourth, uh, first, uh, fourth guy to walk on the moon, give a talk. They had uh, the guy that ran the um, uh, New Horizon, uh, Alan Stern, gave a talk uh, there. So they have you know major people in, in astronomy and, and uh, give talks on, on Saturday night for the main. Um, uh, same event. They also have uh, a swap meet 
uh, on Saturday morning. It's supposed to start at 7.30. It usually starts at 4 o'clock in the morning. And I've dragged home tons of stuff from the swap meet. You never know what you're going to find. There was a Quest Star there this year, too, if you want you know, somebody who's trying to sell a Quest Star. But you never know what you're going to find at the swap meets. Um, like I said, they have on, on Saturday night, they have the, the famous raffle. And Al Nagler usually donates a couple of set of real expensive eyepieces. Uh, two years ago, on, I bought five dollars worth of raffle tickets and won, so I got a couple thousand dollars of ethos and Naglers and everything else like that. So uh, I have it's it's a real good time. Uh, it's like I said, it's 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 a family affair too. There's people been coming up there with their kids. People camp. Like I said, I'm too old for that now. I stay in a little town on the other side because I like a a, a warm bed and a hot shower in the morning. Um, so the club was started in 1923 and how it started was this guy, Russell Porter right here. He, um, his claim to fame was, uh, he went off to help design the, uh, Hale telescope. But when he was in Springfield, he was working for Jones and Lampson machine company and he had built some telescopes and he offered a, uh, uh, class in making mirrors. And these are the people that signed up for that original mirror making class, uh, in 1923, including a woman. Um, and they started the club. So these are the original, the original people that actually started the club in 1923. Um, and like any club, you got to have a clubhouse. And if you go, the feeling they have, I, I get is like, if you guys watch the, uh, old enough to see the little rascal show, like you got, you know, when I was a kid too, we all had to have a clubhouse Well, these guys had to have a clubhouse. So they, on top of this, on top of Breezy Hill, that Porter owned some land he donated, they built this clubhouse. And that's what it looked like in 1923. And that's what it looks like today. It's still there. It's colored pink. That's the official meeting place of the Springfield Telescope Makers, where I'm a member. We still have our meetings there. Uh, the club is a little bit unique in that you can't just join. You just can't pay a membership to join. You have to be, uh, you have to, you have to be nominated to become a member. Uh, and then you're voted in as an associate member for one year, at least one year. And then to become a full member, you have to make a telescope mirror or some piece of optics and it has to be judged good enough to become a full member. And luckily I'm a full member. Um, uh, the Springfield telescope makers like to eat before every meeting, there is a full, at least three course dinner to five course dinner. Je Jeff would fit right in there as a chef. Yeah. Hey. Um, so, you know, when I go up, I try to get up there two, three times a year. It's, it's, I, I really enjoy it. I have a really good time up there. And it's, it's, it's typical Vermont. Um, you know, it's a little town. Like I said, there's nothing really around there. It's, I mean, there's no Walmarts or anything else like that. It's a little tiny town with, with, you know, little mom and pop stores and things of that nature. So this is inside the clubhouse. It's a, it's a two room, two or three room clubhouse. It's a small place, but they've got all kinds of historic pieces of information, you know, artifacts from the 20s and 30s when the club first started. Like this is an original painting that uh, uh, Horace Brown did that was on the cover of uh, Scientific American. Um, like I said, there's there's this giant meteorite this, uh, that they've had for years. And in the wintertime, one of the club members has to take it home and nurse it, make sure it's OK. Um, <laughs> but again, there's, you know, and, uh, you know, there's an asteroid named after Stella Thane. So there's a lot of historic uh, artifacts up there, and it's got a lot of history about telescope making and, and, and astronomy and, and the United States in general. Um, so the main feature that I go up for is the telescope competition. And since this was the 100th anniversary of, of the club for me, they had a number of members that dressed up in historic clothes and you know uh, mm -hmm. acted like the original members. And this is a, a friend of mine, Steve Dotson. He's dressed up like Russell Porter here. And this is the famous uh, Porter turret telescope, okay? So the way this crazy thing works here, there's a big optical flat that goes in here. It's got a hole in the center. This, be this, this beam structure here, there's a 12 inch F-17 mirror that sits out here. This whole thing rotates and this flat rotates. So you get, you get right ascension motion this way to follow the stars and this is your declination. And you're totally inside this little hut all the time. So that's what it looks like on the inside to steer this telescope. So you do all your observations on the inside. It's nice and warm in the winter time. It's cool in the summertime and the mosquitoes aren't in there to eat you alive in the summer. And you can observe uh, in, in comfort in this thing. And I said, this, this thing was made in the 1930s. It's still operational today. 
It gives wonderful images. Uh, I've, I've used it a number of times. Like I said, you're totally inside, so you're totally dark adapted and you're comfortable. So it's really, always at the same position. What's this? No, the eyepiece, see this whole dome rotates. So sometimes the eyepiece would be up here and you got to look in here, but most of the time for looking for most of the observations, it's, you know, in, in this type of range here. So you see this whole dome rotates with this eyepiece. Mm -hmm. So what's the aperture? 12, 12 inch F17. So like I said, this is this is a uh, Saturday morning and people are starting to set up the telescopes for, for the competition here. So there's a number, like I said, they have two different types of telescope competitions on Friday night or Saturday night, depending on the weather. They have the optical competition, where they judge the quality of your optical optics. And then on Saturday morning, Saturday, morning, Saturday afternoon, they judge the mechanical uh, um, operation of the telescopes that are entered. So you get all kinds of crazy telescopes that are entered in this thing. Like like this crazy thing here, okay. So this is this is a five inch refractor. It's called a sheep shank mount. It's actually an antique. It was made by a guy by the name of Alan uh, uh, Gein, and Gein is famous for a barlow. But you sit in this chair and you look in the eyepiece down here. This is the polar axis that turns, and this is the declination axis. Oh. That's ten minutes. Okay, well I'm gonna make it faster then. Yeah. <laughs> okay, <Middle> so. <laughs> So again, so you get all kinds of people there. This little, this young man was, a, was uh, he's 11 years old. He restored this telescope, okay? And unfortunately, I was set up right next to him. He was having problems with it. He couldn't get the eyepiece to work. When, it, when he showed up, it didn't work. And uh, I, I told him, I figured out that it was stuck. I pulled it out when we got the mirror aligned on it, okay? Here's the judges judging the telescope. He won for junior telescope and antique telescope design. And he's 11 years old and he said it's gonna go work for NASA. So who knows what's yeah. gonna happen. Okay. Awesome. So this young man, two years ago, I helped him via email make a six inch mirror. He won a first prize in optics that year. And he came back with this telescope, which is a 10 inch that he built. He's now in college. And uh, for those of you guys that know, that is my encoder system on there. So yeah, another big telescope. You know, like I said, they all come in all safe shapes and sizes. Here's a binocular telescope that was 3D printed. Another beautiful big telescope. Another daub in the background. There's a sheaf spiegler back here. It's, it's, it's a six inch sheaf spiegler. The, the gentleman that made it uh, is based on my design for the smaller one that I have that I designed and built. Another telescope, you can see this, this, this wood burn with this mural in it, just absolutely beautiful design. This wonderful, this is this like, like machinist masterpiece wow. with all this kind of stuff that this guy made is a 12 inch, it's absolutely beautiful telescope. A little portable telescope that comes all apart, it's a backpacking type thing. Here's one that had a pink tube that the guy 3D printed. Mm -hmm. Good old me with mine that I built. This is made from junk. Mm -hmm. I, I won a first prize in a uh, master uh, master uh, optical uh, competition. So that, you know, that's my 27th award. Wow. If you wanted to get your mirror coated, they actually had a mirror coating system oh. set up so you can have your mirror coated. A number of people had their mirror coated there. One of the best shirt category. Yes. Um, the other thing that at Stellafane, they have a spectroheliscope. This is the optics on the outside. I My claim to fame up there, too, is I restored this instrument for them. This is inside the building, and you sit here, and you actually look at the sun, and you can see the sun in any wavelength you want. We usually have it set up for hydrogen alpha. Uh, you know, here I am. I've got my claim to fame now, so when I'm dead and gone, somebody might even actually remember me a little bit. <laughs> Um, it, besides Stellafane, there is the Hartness House, which is James Hartness. He was the governor of uh, Vermont. It's a real beautiful house that's just off of Main Street there. Like I said, the, the, there's two roads. There's the Main Street, and it, it crosses, and you make a left, and you go up to his house. He has a very large turret telescope, like the one that, it's the predecessor of the one that's up at Stellafane. This has a 10-inch uh, brassier uh, refractor lens in it. Again, this turns this whole dome turns and then this goes up and down to point anywhere you're inside to get to this get inside here there's a set of underground tunnels which is really cool and 
In some of the rooms that he have now, they have the Telescope Makers Museum that are just full of all kinds of artifacts from Stellafane and you know guys that built telescopes and things like that and where the hobby started. Like this John Pierce ho hobby graphs, he, he made these hobby graphs that would sent out on how to build different telescopes. Uh, and he, he would sold parts. Down here, you can see these are patterns for uh, wooden telescopes where they make the uh, castings from. There's one of the old telescopes that was one of the original Springfield telescope makers built. This was sitting, this was mounted in his backyard for a number of years and they restored it and it's on display. Again, cases are full of all kinds of different artifacts from telescope making patterns and things of this nature. Um, and about Russell Porter. And like I said, so that's 100 years of uh, cell thing. Thank you and congratulations. Was awesome. was that 14 minutes, Jeff? You're good. Thank you. My I, didn't, I didn't get my cane out yet, okay. so. Next up, Rob Lancaster is going to tell us about Belize. Yep. So just as a little introduction, uh, this summer we went on a trip to Belize. Uh, and Belize, if you do not know, uh, is right down here. Uh, it's in Central America, uh, and we actually went to the kind of western part of Belize. It wasn't near Belize City. It was a little further to the west. The capital city is called Belmopan, and we were actually south of that at a place called Cave Branch Resort. Um, so actually, we might be interested in going back at some time. It's a wonderful country. Uh, they speak English there. Uh, they're very friendly people. It's the official language is English. It's the only one in Central America, as far as I know, and maybe even the only one in South America. So I'm not sure that's the but yeah. yeah. But yeah, it's English language, which is kind of nice for us. Uh, also, I'll point out that they have the largest uh, coral reef uh, outside of Australia. Hmm. So we might go back to see that. We didn't see that on our trip. We were simply visiting Caves Branch Resort and all the stuff out here. So we never even went there. I have a little video. I'm going to show part of this to give you an intro. So the stuff in this video is stuff we did. We did basically all their tours. Adventurous, like nowhere else in the world. My name is Ian Anderson, and I'm the founder and creator and operations manager. And, that's all. and I do want to point out about this guy. He's not from a big corporation. He doesn't work for Hilton or anything like that. He set up his own operation out there in the woods. It was originally a restaurant and campground. And over time, he just kept adding things to it. He's a visionary. He kept trying this and trying that. Started making cheese. Had an idea of bringing in a petting zoo. That kind of didn't work, but the cheese did work. And uh, so, yeah, a lot of interesting things that he was just attempting. And he ended up building this really impressive resort, which he's going to tell you more about. He's a nice guy, too. I spoke with him uh, at least two occasions when I was there. This brand new venture company, we've done a lot. Here's the little hut. So the pictures you just saw of like those fields and them going off on the trails in the woods, they own all that land and they lease it to farmers so that they can farm on that land. But it is actually owned by Caves Branch. And they own the area around the caves and the adventures that they're going on. So they're the only people that can go there on tours because they own everything around it. And nobody else can get there. He was a very big visionary, bought a bunch of land and it was cheap. It was very smart, by the way. Every individual regardless of whether you're a young family or a family. We make every experience for every one of our guests. How are you, Rob? 
yes. Okay. Uh, so that thing you just saw is a rappel into a sinkhole. And uh, you saw, also saw the caving adventure. I went on that tour. So they have bunches of tours through caves and rappelling tours. We rappelled down a waterfall and a number of other really exciting things that they offered. But I reckon this is the waterfall cave. I recognize that one. And we did jump into the pool. That's pretty cool. I think that's at the bottom of the sink Okay, they're holding their heads a little bit higher, their shoulders a little bit backward, and they feel a sense of accomplishment and self confidence in themselves by surviving. We had people that come back 20 years later after the first came, and it's just not good as the adventures are just as good as the adventures. And they serve lunch like that every day. They make a big spread in the cave or whatever adventure you're on. And that's where I want to stop that. And we'll continue with my presentation. So I have some photos of some different things that we did while we were there. And this just shows you some things around the resort. Uh, so we weren't exactly sleeping in just like hammocks in the woods or anything like that. It was like five-star accommodations that they were offering. We had this massive place that we had that was just for us. Um, they had you know a couple pools that kind of flowed into one another. Uh, there was a nice jacuzzi tub. Uh, drinks were included. So there was a whole list of included drinks. You got as many as you want while you were there. And uh, they had dinner uh, with all the guests kind of together. So you'd sit with different groups of people on different nights and you got to talk about your different adventures and stuff like that. Uh, at the very end, we got our own table because uh, they noticed that we stayed two weeks, which was like longer than anyone had ever stayed before. And so they're like, we're going to do something special for them. They gave us our own table and they baked us a cake, which is really nice. It was really quite cool. But this is the area you eat dinner. What's that? Yes. So <laughs> if you go to any of those like cruises or anything like that, they always take the towels and make towel animals and stuff like that. These guys were especially talented at that. And they made a lot of different animals. As I said, we were there longer. So they had to come up with new things. It's not an alligator mummy. No, okay. that's their most dramatic towel thing that they made. Yeah, but it was pretty cool. Here's uh, some photos of us on our adventures. This is that uh, rappelling down into the sinkhole. Uh, you can see this is the fields on the way out to where we were going. Uh, you can see this is us climbing through the jungle, through the woods. And this is the one of the military type trucks that they had to take us to the different places. So they had tractors and big military vehicles, and a couple different things that they would take you in. It was pretty cool. And you can see here's some of the termite nests and stuff like that. There were lots of animals out there that you could see. There also was a lot of history. Uh, so we were right in the center of the Mayan civilization. Uh, there are definitely more pyramids in South America and big ones, like really big pyramids, more than in, in Egypt. Like we think of pyramids, we think of Egypt. There are so many in South America because they would just build them. Their civilizations and their cities would go up and they'd have like tons of pyramids built around this site. And then another one would pop up and a whole bunch would appear. So... Another thing that we saw a lot of was remains of their pottery and stuff like that, because an interesting observation is they believed that in order to complete the sacrifice and bring the rains, they had to smash the pots when they were done. So they had these elaborate pots where they were doing, you know, whatever human or animal sacrifices they were doing, and then they would smash the pots. So there was large amounts of just pottery strewn around, and you could touch pieces of pottery that were you know, 1,000 years old, 2,000 years old. And that was actually pretty cool. In some of the caves, there were so many sacrifices that had been made over the years to bring the rains. It was this thick of ash from all the fires. And get it on you, <laughs> which was interesting, to say the least. Uh, this is an intact pot. And they had those two, they're called utility pots. So they keep these pots for like holding water you know, so that the people, while they were doing sacrifices and whatever, would have some resources, you know, while they're in the cave. 
Um, they actually called, the Mayans called the underworld Chapalba. And if you actually look, you see the stalactites coming down and you can kind of see the trees growing up off the top of the cave. And it looks like the roots of the trees kind of. So that might be why they were thinking they had to give these roots something in order to produce rain. But I don't know what they were thinking. But I will also note that a lot of their human sacrifices were willing participants, which surprised me. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason is because in their belief system, if you did participate in a sacrifice, you'd skip past some of the challenges of the underworld, and that would advance you toward coming back into something better, right? So that's kind of cool. And we climbed a number of pyramids while we were down there. And here's us at one of the most dramatic places, that's Tikal but I'll show you more of that in a bit. Here's some photos of our caving expeditions. Uh, we actually spent one week there just doing caving trip after caving trip after caving trip because they do offer a whole bunch of trips and we purposely stayed there enough nights that we could do almost all of them. The only adventures we didn't do while we were there were things that involved overnight things. Like there was one where you could go into a cave, spend the night and keep hiking. But we were like, well, if we're paying all this money to have a place to stay, why would you sleep in the cave? <laughs> and likewise for the one that was sleeping in the jungle. I don't want to sleep in the jungle when I got a hut that I'm paying for. <laughs> so yeah, we didn't do those, but we did all the others on the list. And it was definitely very cool. Here's some pictures of some animals that we saw while we were there. There were tons of animals of all different types. You could see there were spiders. Um, there were insects. There were amphibians, there were all sorts of exciting things. Uh, we also saw uh, leaf cutter ants. I think you could see that up there. There were more types of ants down there than I think I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. The leaf cutter ants were quite interesting because they made little highways through the leaves and they carried the leaves down the little highways and they would put them down in their anthill and they would farm fungi that they would eat. It was very interesting, very dramatic. And there were also these, uh, marching ants that they had, which would all march together, swarm, and then go on. Uh, and we did have one incident in our place with um, animals, and it was ants that came in. They swarmed our place, and then they left. Like, it was literally a half an hour, and just one time in the two weeks, and then they were gone. Like, we called them, we called the people at the, that were on duty at the hotel. We're like, can you do something about these ants? But by the time they got there, the ants were gone. So, I don't know. It was interesting. Here's uh, one of the sites that we visited uh, during the day uh, that were outside. This is Zunantinich. And he said, if you can't pronounce Zunantinich, you can just say tuna sandwich and that'll be close enough. Mm -hmm. uh, it should also be noted that a number of the names of these places uh, were long after the Mayans. We had lost the information about these places and we didn't even know that they were in fact pyramids they had gotten so overgrown and become like just mountains um, over time. They had just decayed and eroded because they're made out of limestone. So they erode just like the caves do. And they got covered in vegetation and nobody knew there was something there until somebody dug and found it. So this is Zunantinich again. Uh, you can see here's a chamber with a whole bunch of bats, but you can also see how elaborate some of their designs were and their pyramids. It wasn't just a pile of rocks. It was dramatic. This is some of the last remaining uh, facade that they had. And in fact, this is a replica. The actual facade is behind that to protect it. Because hmm. after they dug it out, it would be exposed to the elements and it would erode further. So they kind of covered it up and made a replica. Uh, this is a ball court. So the Mayans actually really liked their games. And this is their ball court area where they would play those games. And um, I think there might have been sacrifices involved in that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, this place is called Kahal Kahal. And that name means place of ticks. Oof. Yeah. <laughs> and again, that's not what the Mayans would have called it. That's what it was named by the people that put their farm animals there and had them grazing around this little pasture. Mm -hmm. And they brought ticks. <laughs> But when the Mayans were there, there probably wouldn't have been any ticks. But that's where the name came from. Um, and they didn't talk too much about this. But of course, these buildings that you see, these pyramids, would have had alignments with the stars. There would have been alignments for predicting uh, when the sun 
uh, would be in certain parts of the sky, when you should plant and harvest your crops, when the rainy season is going to come. And that's how the Aztec leaders, sorry, the Aztec, the Mayan leaders, the Aztecs were farther away. That's how the Mayan leaders got all their power uh, because they could make these predictions. They had the scientific knowledge because they studied the stars. And that's a nice example of one of those things that would align with the solstice. And here is just some pictures of some areas of that uh, ruin that have been uncovered. And you can see this is where they would have slept. And you can see here's where they would have had the royal family in their chambers. Tikal is in Guatemala. That's one of the most dramatic and amazing Mayan ruins. And I think the Aztecs did actually come there as well at some point. Uh, but Tikal is one of those places that people come from around the world. That's, that's the big one. Uh, we did go to Guatemala to see that. Uh, it was a day adventure that was completely organized and paid for by Caves Branch. So they took us over. They shoveled us through that country as quick as they could. Um, it was a little interesting to observe outside the, the van, but um, we safely got there. Uh, it was interesting though. Here's a nice uh, map that they'll sell you at the entrance if you want to pay for it, showing all the different sites and the path between them. And our time in there was kind of short because we had to travel to Guatemala and then see the site and get home in time for dinner. Uh, but they took us through to a whole bunch of different things. We scaled a whole bunch of these pyramids and saw a vast amount of this area in here. There also were a lot of animals that we saw while we were there. Uh, so these are photos that I specifically took at Tikal. Uh, but we could see like monkeys in the trees our whole trip there. We saw them in Cave Branch at our resort. Uh, so there are the howler monkeys uh, up in the trees. And they do howl at night sometimes. They didn't really disturb our sleep, but we did hear them howling at night. Um, but that just shows here's the monkey right there that I managed to get a photo of. Uh, actually, this is kind of covering up. Ah, that's a little better. Yeah, now you can see it. Uh, so another thing that we saw on the top of one of these pyramids uh, mm -hmm. was a photo that you could see in one of the Star Wars movies. So Jungle Moon Yavin 4, that shot was taken from the top of Temple 4, I think it was, at Tikal. And you can see the pyramids here in the distance match the pyramids there in the movie. That's cool. And so I just mm -hmm. kind of overlaid the two photos so you could see that we were on Yavin 4. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. I did do a little bit of astronomy photos while I was there. I brought my DSLR, I brought a sky tracker. Most of the time it was cloudy, unfortunately. So yeah, uh, but I did get some stars one night that ended up being clear. I, I actually figured out that the dry creek bed had a good view of the sky. You know, around most of the resorts, there were lots of trees. It's a jungle after all. But uh, in the middle of the creek bed, I was able to set it up and get a photo like this. I did actually manage to get a photo here of the Southern Cross, as well as Alpha Centauri. But it's not very well shown. So here is the Southern Cross. There's Alpha Centauri over there. But, you know, that's the best I got. It actually looked a lot better. I went and got the camera, and then some clouds came and messed with the shot. But, you know, best I got. Um, the other thing that I was going to present was the starlings. Maybe, yeah. you, you maybe, let's hold off on that one. We can wait. Yeah. yeah. Save that for next month, maybe. Thank yeah. you, Rob. Yep. Let's hold off. Next up, Ron Warden is now going to tell us what he did this summer. Ron, all yours. All right. Well, I uh, built an observatory in 2003, roll off, and I moved in 2013 and got another observatory. So my equipment was getting old and uh, out of date. So uh, this summer I decided to get new stuff. So I got um, the Sharp Star um, 260 F5 Astro graph um, and it, they are aspherical 
main uh, and a, a spherical, uh, almost like a rigid Crichton. And these, you don't have to have a um, field flattener to make the edges uh, sharp. So this is version two. No, this is version one and version uh, two. Uh, no, this is version two. And I have version one, which is a little different in the back here, but basically they're the same. And um, it's a 1300 millimeter F5. And this is the specs here. And well, um, and then the cameras uh, for the, um, I have a 102 refractor. Um, and the camera for it was the 2600 uh, uh, mono, and uh, it's a CMOS. And the um, pixel size is 3.76. And I, I mainly wanted these cameras as EWO because I wanted motion pictures and I wanted uh, a lighter camera. And I like the CMOS. And uh, it came with us, uh, the ZWO 7x2 filter wheel, astronomic LRGB uh, uh, far focals, up the long FHO and three nanometer uh, filters. And this one here was the color, and the color is on the, uh, the 10 inch, and the black and white is on the uh, 102 um, Explorer that I had. This one here is the, has, uh, 4.78 microns uh, filter um, size as uh, frames per second is 10. So, and this is the cord management module. And this is a, now my, I used to have a lot of, I used to have a mead. This is my 102 here, my guider here, the two cameras and filter wheel. And I used to have a mead, which, oh man. The, the focus of a mead, that, that fo it moves the mirror to focus, which is a, a pain. So anyhow, my cords aren't the best, but they're a lot use, uh, better than they used to be. And I'm, when I get time, I'm going to have shortened my USB cords for up here to look better. Got a little bit of string here, but anyhow. First, uh, I took this one here. I did that for fun so I could get the moons of Jupiter. And that's the moon. And with the, the um, um, SBIG, uh, they always had to have a filter to uh, because the moon was so bright. bright. And like this one here has a fast enough shutter that I could get. It was down to zero, zero, 003. Wow. So that sucker was fast. Cool. So I made up for your time. <laughs> Thank hey, you, Ron. Ben, ben, hey, hey. So you still have to talk for seven minutes, Ron. No. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and congratulations. Looks like some nice toys. Well, they work better than the other. Next up, uh, Jared is going to share um, about his trip to Cherry Springs. Oops, what is this? That yeah, that's what you wanted, right? Yes. Okay. Cool. <laughs> Yeah, I uh, didn't like prepare a fancy slideshow. Uh, okay. Um, so this is where Cherry Springs is, if you weren't aware. It's probably the nearest um, site to Delaware that has, like, pretty dark skies um, up in mid-northern Pennsylvania. It's like about five, five and a half hour drive for me, kind of in between all these different state forests. Yeah. Um, and I, I, we, so I was invited um, by a group of undergraduate students at the University of Delaware. They're part of the uh, a student or organization called SPS, uh, Society of Physics Students. Um, and I was basically invited to join them. 
And we ended up going to a cabin and this is kind of like a panoramic view of the of the view from the cabin um, that we stayed for three nights in July in late July. It was like the weekend of July 22nd that we went there. Mm -hmm. Actually, I had to tell them to to move the date because they originally wanted to go like like the last weekend in, in July. And I was like, guys, there's gonna be a full moon. Um so so I so my my input like the, my input was uh, helpful in that in that regard but you got uh, it was completely in the middle of nowhere there here's the uh the barn for the local mule her <laughs> name was penny and you'll get to see a picture of her and beyond that beyond that that barn is a was a pavilion that we were able to like like have activities in <laughs> at night and then um uh, over here if it get gets all pixely this this barn over here was was off limits um we called it the we we dubbed it the murder barn um because it looked kind of looked kind of sketchy um but this whole property like and all and like this is like actually like, kind of selling it short but there was a very big hill and like the mule would like wander wander way up by the tree lines kind of all this area was mule was able to uh roam around in um there's me with the mule <laughs> Penny <laughs> had to get a photo of the mule actually, and I was a, and I also practiced on the mule with my um, I had a, I, I brought a spotter scope with a DSLR, so I was practicing with uh getting a picture of the mule, um, but yeah, with the DSLR, um, like the night before we actually went to Cherry Springs, um, uh, yeah, just the Milky Way. Milky Way picture with with my DSLR. I think this was like probably like thirty two hundred ISO for like three minutes ish. Um, so that was like one of the pictures I could get. Um, from where? This was from our cabin. Um, near both the state park and like the nearest town was this town called Cowder Cowder Sport, Pennsylvania. But it was like this is like completely in the middle of nowhere as far as the middle of nowhere as you can get in pennsylvania really mm -hmm. um but this is like pretty close to what the sky actually looked like um not not quite as dramatic as this to the, to the naked eye but it was pretty close to that cool did you intentionally frame that to kind of come down onto that utility pole i did want to get something in the back in the foreground to kind of like ground it yeah um it's cool i like it instead of having it just be a pure mm -hmm. sky i guess yeah. Um and yeah the the I thought the phone pole like worked out nice mm -hmm. in that regard. It's like um, the pot at the end of the rainbow. Yeah. So as far as getting so as far as the actual um park itself um mm -hmm. which we went to on Saturday some of these pictures are higher resolution than others. Um, so Cherry Springs is really there's not really that much there. Um, it's it's kind of set up like a like a campground that you could take a, like a tent to or an RV, but there were no RVs. There were tents though. We didn't have a tent though. I would say the the, the most important thing I learned from this trip um, was if possible, go with someone who's like like gone there before or done this sort of thing before and knows what they're doing. <laughs> um, and if you can't do that, then at least try to come prepared because my biggest mistake was that like, I was so concerned with the whole um, I wanted to go there, like, uh, everyone else in my group really, like, they had no experience with, like, astrophotography or anything like that. They were kind of just, like, there to look at the stars or whatever. Like, I, I was so concerned with uh, my astrophotography that I didn't really consider the fact that, like, I should be prepared to spend the night in a very dark, a very cold field, kind of at high elevations. Um, you see the, see me there in my running shorts. Um and no jacket. I didn't have any warm clothes whatsoever. A, a lot of mis yeah. I did have my nice um, you can't really see them in this picture, but I had my planet socks. Yeah. Um how cold did it get at night? I mean, cold enough that I started to see frost accumulate on my windshield. Ooh. Ooh. Um and you can't have any lights or anything, you can't turn your car on. It kind of worked like it was like purely an honor system though. There was no one there like enforcing any rules, but mm -hmm. like like everyone was trying to be respectful and like not I was actually very self-conscious about the light that I was um emitting. 
Um, and then me in the background, there was one other person in our group that had like a, a kind of a more simple setup, like just a tripod, um, all that Smith tripod and, and an Orion scope. And he was actually getting some pretty decent, like just snapshots with, with he had a DSLR, which is getting like taking just snapshot photos of just random stuff with random stuff in the sky. Yeah. Um, just so, and <laughs> most of these photos were not taken by me because I was just like in my whole world, just like, I was like kind of scrambling with my equipment because I actually hadn't used my equipment in over a year actually before this. Um, I had taken a long hiatus because I had gone back to school and was so distracted with schoolwork that I never, that I would not really get a chance to take all my equipment out and do something like this. Uh, okay, that, here's me with, I can't see my socks. <laughs> but yeah, I was, here I was like <laughs> laser focused. I was looking at, um, like there's my, I've got the ZWO ASI 1600 mil, 1600 M like monochrome. And I remembered that I needed to have like, like I think 56 millimeters of space between my um, field flattening lens and the camera sensor. But I didn't, like I had all these like little black rings that you screw on and I didn't remember what order they go on or if I, even if I had all of them. So I was like reading like the light, like, oh, this one's at 16 millimeters, this one's 11 millimeters. So I was trying to do math in my head and like do the, get this all set up before like the sun went down. <laughs> so I was very absorbed in this and was not paying attention to anything else was going on. <laughs> Another picture of some of, some of the other uh, guys that were there, mm -hmm. some other students. Um, Actually, I'll go back to this one real quick. Um, this was just a snapshot I took of the sun with a, I had like just a, a solar, uh, well, white light solar filter, but it was like, it's like a Celestron. So they, I guess, intentionally like tinted orange to make it look more sun-like, I guess. Yeah. Um, but I was kind of happy with the love like, like little sunspots you could see there. Not nearly as impressive as Rob's solar viewing set up with his H alpha fancy fanciness. Um, um, but <laughs> there was actually like another there was actually like a, I had to remove a speck but there was like oh there was like a big sunspot there and then I realized that it was like it was dust. Mm -hmm. So I had to actually like artificially take that out of the picture. Um and yeah I guess so this is what I came up with ultimately this was the the big the big result of of that Saturday night of suffering in the cold, like mm -hmm. yeah, um, this is like a mosaic of the Andromeda galaxy, mm -hmm. um, and it was very difficult. It was a very challenging project um, on the uh, image processing side of things. Like, I think the project got up to like hundred gig, like over a hundred gigabytes of, which is like for me, that's a lot. <laughs> For, for a single project. Um, and it was like, it was pretty ambitious to do a mosaic after having not done really any photography for like a year to tr to, to jump straight into a mosaic, but I pretty much had no choice because Andromeda is like so huge that it doesn't fit into a single frame. Um, but uh, I don't remember anymore. I think I had, I think I had about 85 use about, about 85 usable subframes. Um, oh, two panels. Yeah, sorry, two panels um, that I stitched together. Um, when I saw that in the focus, my immediate instinct reaction was that was one of the most three-dimensional looking astrophotos I'd ever seen. It just really jumped out at me. Um, so, yeah, it's really I'm incredible. Glad. I'm you glad you like it. You get under dark skies, you got a telescope. I mean, that's what it looks like. Yeah. That's what I'm having in Vermont. That's what you see in the night. It's amazing. Yeah. See up there versus around here. Yeah, the it's definitely good having the dark skies and like I wanted to, to do something that would take advantage of that. So I didn't want to do like narrow band imaging. I wanted to do something like kind of full spectrum color. Um, because I think I, I figured that would most take advantage of the dark skies. What was the camera? Uh it's a ZWO ASI sixteen hundred monochrome. Yeah, camera. 
Yeah. Like the same one that like Nico Carver has basically. Um, pretty much. Um, but yeah, I was happy with so is that and actually like I mean, I was I was struggling all night with the uh with my equipment, and um, that's a that's a discussion for like the AP Sig AP Sig meetings. Which, by the way, they did they did give me some advice to help me produce this image. So I think that I thank that group for 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 the advice that they offered on that. Um, one of the things was like you can actually see a little bit of like a flare at the top, almost um coming from the we we discovered Bill pretty much discovered that it was. Probably coming from the bright star, like twenty was it twenty five Andromeda or 30, 35 35 Andromeda. Yeah. Um, we figured yeah. that it. It's a magnitude four point five star out of its field. But yeah, the point being, I I had struggled with my equipment since it had been a while, and and I probably could have gotten more data, um, if I was kind of at the top of my game, I guess you could say. Um, but even with the limited amount of data I got, I think I got a pretty decent image, I would say. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So, yeah. so I know it was 85, I think it was 85 subframes. And so nine, 90 minutes or 90 seconds, sorry, I think per subframe, I think. For all night. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was a single night and I was trying to image from from as soon as I could sundown to like I think four o'clock in the actually I think I would have gone past four o'clock in the morning but at that point it had tried to meridian flip and then like the camera like hit my tripod oh, and that was that was game over like that's always game over for me when that when it does that so um but yeah I think it turned out nice and it, and I also say while I was there like I saw more like uh meteors and like and like fireballs or what, mm. what have you. I think it was it was kind of right at the start of like the um what was it the Perseids? Yeah. yeah. It was kind of right at the start of that whole season, and I saw like more more of those in one night than I've seen in my whole life, and including a couple that were like so bright that they were like casting shadows. It's like almost like fireworks. Um, yeah. It was it was intense. So there was there was some there was some pain involved with the cold and me being underdressed and That's all right and Your shivering pain and, our benefit and being self-conscious about the light I was emitting um like I had like my laptop that I had like dimmed as far as I could make it and then also like a red filter over top of that and it was still emitting sort of like enough light that was making me feel like really self-conscious about like is anyone around me going to be like irritated by how much light I'm giving off but no one like approached me about like complaining about that so um, okay. well, you right. can uh, knock the light down in at least in three different three out of four directions just with a big plastic bin if you put your laptop in. Yeah, I didn't. Inside. I didn't have the. I had a plastic bin, but it had it had all my equipment in it, so oh, okay. I couldn't use that. You could I, use the bin that you'd pack all your warm clothing in. <laughs> if I if I if I didn't. Yeah. Make, make sure to be prepared for a camping trip, not just a astrophotography session. Um, yeah. I ended up actually like. I was experimenting with a few things I had on hand. I had like a white t-shirt that I tried throwing over it, but the, the light was still getting, it was a, just a thin white t-shirt. So, so the light was still kind of getting through that. And then I tried throwing my, um, I've got like a windshield, like a sun, sun shield for my wind, for my windshield that I threw over. And so like, at least in like two directions, it was blocking the light, but then in two other directions, the light was getting through. Um, but, uh, but put it over, you'll get one too. <laughs> I did have like a I had a, I had a towel in, in my back seat that I kind of had to wrap wrap a towel around me as I was shivering all night and listening to the coyotes or whatever that there was a pack of coyotes that I went through. Now you can do a duffel bag and put one clothes in it, leave it in your car, and then that you won't forget it. And yeah, I mean, I definitely learned learned from my mistakes. So if I ever were to do something like this again, I would definitely be better prepared. Did somebody in your group have a tent or anything? No one had any tents. Um, there was, all we had was this, like I guess tarp tarp setup. So did they freeze too? So they all froze too, but they like so we had two cars. I had, I had my car with all my stuff in it, and then they and then they had a minivan. So everyone kind of after about. After a couple of hours uh, after sundown, they they decided it wasn't fun to stay out and look at the stars anymore because it was cold. So they all just piled into the the minivan, um, and as soon as it got light out, like 
we were we were the first ones out of there like mm. but someone had closed the gate behind us at some point um and we were waiting around like was, is anyone going to come like open the gate <laughs> and one guy at one point was like if no one comes to open the gate i'm just like blowing it through the through the through the gate like i got i gotta get out like we were we were ready to get out of there we were ready to rip out of there as soon as we could um and then go back to our cabin and act and and get some actual sleep because no one got any good sleep that night we were too cold no cool. one was super prepared we had some snacks some of them got some of them got it and some of them got soggy do you think the skies are pretty much as good at your cabin as they were out in this field they were they were pretty much as good at the at the cabin um but okay. I, we but i wanted to go okay. i wanted to get the get the cherry springs experience so the other the others of your group have uh, telescopes or cameras or anything just yeah. one other just one other person had had uh, this tripod um with a little with a little telescope and a dslr no one else no one no one else in the group <laughs> knew the first thing about telescopes honestly <laughs> um so i'm actually like not even sure i never asked them like what made them want to go to Cherry Springs? Mm -hmm. And then I guess they wanted to look at just wanted to do stargazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this was the only other telescope besides mine. Mine is in the background, the ABX in the background there. Um, but yeah, that's all, that's all I had. Cool. It's fun. Thank you. Next up. Tiger Cosmos is going to share an interesting adventure, and I will leave it at that to not ruin any surprises. Tiger, all you. All right, thank you. Okay, so uh, this summer, Rob, Jeff, Bill, and myself did a road trip to Neef and the Horn and Bell Labs. And this is um, some shots from Neef. And here's Al Magler. Um, he was there for Teleview. And uh, the interesting thing about going to, I guess, I don't know if they're all like this, but uh, Teleview, their, their um, lenses were half the price. So it was a pretty good deal. Um, and then, and also I met the author that uh, was selling these deep sky books. Um, and then over on the up, upper right, you can see how, how many different vendors were at NEF. And then also they had a lot of lectures and Fred Hayes from Hall 13 was one of the uh, lecturers at the event. And he talked about his experience um, as part of the Apollo 13 aircraft. Do you, do you want to add anything? No. no. Not, but... I just like continue to think about the experience that guy had. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah his his story. Um, it seemed like nobody panicked. You know, they're all pretty laid back about possibly dying. Really? <laughs> it's a pretty cool story. Um, and then here, uh, is the horn antenna. Um, and if anybody's not familiar with the horn antenna, this is where they discovered um, cosmic background uh, energy radiation. Microwave background radiation. Yeah. Yep. Um, and uh, which is what led to the confirmation of the Big Bang, I think is the best way to word it. That's experimental evidence. Yes. Yeah. yeah was, at first, they just thought it was interference. They were trying to figure things out. They then moved their lab out to this remote location because they were thinking that there was interference. Um, and so then they discovered that they were still getting the interference. And uh, I guess it was a few months before they figured out what they had. Um, so when we visited the horn antenna, this, this picture, we never got to see this. Um, what we saw was this <laughs> sign here, no trespassing. Um, because at the time what was going on is a developer had bought the property and um, we wanted to build houses. Um, so the city got together and formed this alliance and the city council had a vote and basically they um, decided not to allow uh, the developer to uh, destroy the horn antenna. So the good news is, is that the horn antenna will be there for you to see someday. 
But we haven't seen it. I'm sorry? We haven't seen it yet, then. <laughs> no, we haven't seen it, but we will. So we will. The point is on a side there, because it's actually when it points up, it's actually a section of a parabola. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we um, visited the Homedell Bell Labs. And this is a, the famous laboratory where um, it was basically the control center for the uh, bell, I mean, the, the horn. Um, and this has been converted into kind of a, an interesting business space, mixed use space. They even have a charter school there, I think. Um, but uh, basketball court. <laughs> yeah. the design of it was, was um, at the time, uh, you know, cutting edge. Um, for its era, bringing all these engineers, I think it was like 5,000 engineers all together in one building. And the uh, the incredible inventions or uh, discoveries that were made in this building, um, I, I, I think that they decided to keep it uh, and discover new uses for it. And then here's the transistor water tower that's at the Bell Labs. And it's funny because it's a real water tower, but it was designed to look like a transistor. Um, which was pretty cool. And how about that? That's it. Cool. Sir, <laughs> morning, Tom. I'll try to go back. Let's not eat that. And <laughs> the crazy lady. The to wrap us up, um, Bill, I'm going to let with your two files, I'll just let you take the helm. Bill McKibben is some presentation about overalls. I'm not really sure what this is. It's Oshkosh. I don't know. We'll find out. Yeah, I don't. I think what's happening is when you actually do that, it's chopping off. It's a piece of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, like, you'll see that. It's to correct for the screen being out of line with the projection. But it's not correcting it right now. Is yeah. yeah. The projection is tilted this way. Right. Of course, the curve is coming. Yeah. But it corrects very easily. It's settings on the projector that it's squared up. It doesn't have a load shift. I don't think it's, so. It's in the software. Pretty basic. Okay, All right. I think it probably the scale and heat down the actual. It's good, Bill. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. <laughs> I lost my. Uh... Oh. Oh, maybe do alt tab, Bill, because yeah. we're covering the yeah. Right. And I'm trying to open a link and it's not control click. Oh, is it not working? It is not. You click weird that time. Do it again. You're clicking control while click. shaking. Or maybe control click. I'm control clicking. Oh boy. Right, let me, let me take a look. Let me, let me just open up. Here, let me just try real quick. Ah. No. <laughs> This is supposed to be easy. Yeah. Oh come on. I think I think you were. I, yeah. I was dead still. Oh, oh, oh boy. Uh, well, maybe not. The browser. Oh come problem. on, browser. Maybe, maybe just try it again here. There, I can. Copy uh, paste it in the browser. Yeah. This is not supposed to be so. <laughs> Really putting in your time, you know. <laughs> yeah. Try to sweat a little bit though, too. Yeah. I'm more concerned you want a license. Hey. Yeah, really. He knows how to fly a plane. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. Yeah. Yeah. Well, please call. Yeah. They're found. <laughs> Did you block the screen again? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, let's see the secret stuff. Oh, come on. Better bring the weaker. Yeah. 
You need a clearance to see what's on the screen. I said that. <laughs> clearance, clearance. It's okay to show us the elements. We know about that. <laughs> we break for some snacks and come back. Yes, it's going to be on there. Yeah, actually, while Bill said, does it, do we have snacks today? Yeah, they're on the counter. Oh, you still brought them from the yeah. Oh, awesome. Okay. It doesn't seem to have been set out, but they're in there. Cool. Yeah, great, Bob. Go to CBD. Cool. And she did a good job. You want to watch it coming? Yeah. You want to watch it coming? Jurassic Park. All right. Attacker, you got to get some food. Oh, what's, what's going on, Bill? The damn thing's in the way. I can't even start the present. Oh. Okay, okay I think we're good. No, no. All right. Uh, hey, hey. We have gotten to start. So uh, my adventure this, uh, this summer was marginally related to astronomy, but I'm going to go with the aerospace connection. Uh, and... Uh, so I'm a licensed pilot, as you can see. I'm not a professional like Otto here. Why do we have a screen and a screen, Rob? I'm not sure. There's some things up there on the right. Yeah, there okay. Go. There you go. So Oshkosh is a small town in Wisconsin, not as small as Stellafane, but it's inhabited by 67,000 cheeseheads and Packers fans <laughs> and the like. And every summer in July, they welcome over 10,000 aircraft and several hundred thousand people uh, for an event that can best be described as the Mecca of aviation. So 10 person per aircraft. So, okay, there we go. Wow. Uh, so this is a view of the airfield. Oh my God. It, it looks pretty big here. Uh, and this I've outlined in red, this is the area where all the aircraft are parked. Mm -hmm. All those little white dots that you see, except for maybe some of the buildings in the center, but all the little white dots are all aircraft. And to give it scale, from the far left of that red outlined area to the far right is 2.9 miles. Um, and uh, about, and about, you know, at about a mile deep. The area they do this every year. They do this every year. It's truly <laughs> it's truly the mecca of aviation. You know, if you uh, if you're a pilot or how do you guys land if, and then park or and then get off the ground without yeah. smacking into Stay it? Stay tuned. Uh, that is a that's a whole study in itself. Uh, the area in blue is pretty much all campers. All the oh, white okay. spots you see there are campers. Oh, that's not good. So, and of course, I got my mug here. Uh, so, the, the total number of uh, daily visitors, 677,000 this year, 13,000 campsites. And as you see in this picture, many of those campsites are people pitching their tents right next to their airplanes. You can see they're just lined up wingtip to wingtip, row after row. And, uh, you know, like I said, total of over 10,000. Every type of aircraft you could imagine, I've got them listed there. I won't regurgitate the list, but uh, yeah, it's quite an amazing event. So we had made our plans to go there, had everything booked, and I was on a Zoom call with a group of pilots out of Baltimore. And said, hey, anybody going to Oshkosh? We've got our Airbnb and uh, airline tickets booked. And uh, one guy says, oh, you, you're going by the airlines. It's too bad. I'm flying up in my four seat Piper Cherokee and I was looking for somebody to go with me. Uh, so the next sound that you heard was my airline tickets being ripped to pieces <laughs> and telling my wife, guess what? You're on your own, I'll, I'll meet you there. <laughs> so this is my friend Joe's Piper Cherokee. As you can see, it. it's a four seat aircraft, but it only gets better because we flew up on a Thursday, two days before the show started. Uh, flew into an airport 70 miles northwest of Oshkosh, met up with 43 other Cherokee drivers and got together on Friday for a rehearsal. And Saturday morning, we all flew in together as a formation into the show. So uh, this is kind of what the, how the formation was set up. They were in three plain groups or elements they referred to them. And you know there was element A, B, C, D, 
on through however many it took for 43 uh, or 44 aircraft. Uh, most of them were elements of three, some were elements of two. And uh, that's that part. And now let me see if I can make these. So this is, uh, I gotta, it, it'll go away. Yeah. So this is the group as we were, as we're lining up for departure. That's us right there, Joe Morales. And there are a couple of people that got some phenomenal video like this. Basically, GoPro strap all over the airplane. Yeah. I had a GoPro on ours. Got some okay footage, but nothing as, nothing as good as this. So in the interest of time, I will move to the next one. So this next one, uh, this is not our group. It's a similar group. Uh, our group was not quite as dramatic as this. We were flying in side by side, but this is this is the kind of thing you see at Oshkosh. And this is a group of Moonies. They were landing in formation side by side. Not the call. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they, were, they were flying in for the mass wedding. Yeah. <laughs> the mass sacrifice over the lake. Yes. <laughs> so this was much more dramatic than ours. We we landed single file, but we did manage to land 44 aircraft in about eight minutes. So that was a very cool event. I have to say, were the guys at the tower like let you guys do this kind of stuff? Or they just said, uh, okay, fine. We're just going to turn our eyes the other way and you guys do what you want. So in this case, uh, we had prearranged this. There are several groups, the Moody's, there are uh, uh, Beach Bonanzas, Cessnas, there are about five or six different type clubs that all pre-arranged to do their arrivals the same way. They all, we all had our time slots for coming in. The other way that this is done for just everybody else, there's this whole procedure where they line up at a lake, a couple of different spots. It could be up to like 30 miles away. They all form a big conga line and at half mile intervals, just, you can see it on the flight radar, just hundreds of planes lined up in single file. They've got a group of controllers that sit in a shack with radios and binoculars, and they just call out to the pilots. The pilots don't respond, they just rock their wings. So as each one approaches, they'll send this one this way, the next one that way, and they'll just tell them, uh, you know, high wing Cessna, rock your wings, good rock, you go this way. You know, low wing Cherokee, you go that way and they all converge on one of two uh, runways. But during this event, the Oshkosh control tower is the busiest control tower in the world, hands down, every year. What's the system? There's a plane landing every? Uh, 15 seconds or something. <laughs> For the entire day. Yeah, it's, it's pretty insane. And I think they said they had like 40,000 operations being takeoffs and landings. And they're getting 10,000 aircraft in and back out again. So now you got them on the ground. Now, how do you guys get them all parked? Like <laughs> yeah, so killing somebody with a propeller. Right. <laughs> Lots of volunteers that are very well coordinated. And uh, they, they tell you where to go. You don't tell them, hey, I want to go there. No, you just no pretty much go yeah. where they tell you. They just shuttle everybody. Now, the, the groups like ours, we had our own spot. So we all came in, you know, one after another and all got ushered to the same spot. Same with these other type clubs. But uh, I could go on and on for days. <laughs> There's so much stuff that you can just uh, Google, you know, Oshkosh Air Venture 2023, mm -hmm. and there's endless content. Yeah, quick so. question, uh, Bill. Are they landing on exactly the same runway or are there two different runways there that are? They're not, and that that's a good point. Uh, what you're seeing, you're seeing two of them landing side by side here, and there's a third or, or a second uh, taxiway that they use as a runway for the event. 
But those two planes landed on the same runway. Yes. Which I believe was his question. That is. So yeah. two are landing side by side, and the third is landing on the taxiway. The runway is like 150 feet wide, so they've got room to pull it off. Is, is this the event where they have like this at, at night, this like firework, just like this huge yes. bomb going off at the end with all these flames and stuff? Yes. The, the, the night air show was. You know, pretty spectacular. Friend of mine sent me that. He's a pilot. He says, "Here it comes." I just watch this video. It's the last this thing. Whoa. Yeah, it's just they simulate like bombing runs and yeah, stuff yeah. Oh, uh, with the uh, military aircraft, and uh, yeah, yeah, blow some stuff up pretty nicely. So, uh, like I said, there's tons of stuff online to see, and uh, these are a few highlights. So, in the interest of time, I'll wrap it up there. Cool. Bill, leave it, leave it like this because we got to shut the zoom down in okay. an appropriate manner. Yep. But yeah, thank you, Bill. And again, thanks again to all of our speakers for tonight. And again, keep your eye on the groups.io. There'll be a lot of activities between now and uh, a month from now when we hear John Conrad talk about Osiris Rex and bringing some asteroids back to Earth. Okay. And uh, there are refreshments. So uh, please come and hang out in the library.